you were the perfect guest for us because we're always talking about sooner, faster, retire sooner. I wrote a book called You Can Retire Sooner Than You Think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the five, five money secrets of the happiest retirees. I live the opposite of the live slow life. But me, maybe as you explain this to our audience, it maybe that's not totally true because I, I love, I love your concept and I, and I can relate to their times in life when I, I think perhaps I'm living what, what you are or an expert in, which is this, let's call it the slow, the slow movement. Um, but maybe let's just right out of the gate it, it describe the genesis of this. How, what inspired you to, to, to essentially embrace slow and explain what that means to you sure. and our audience? Sure. Well, I've discovered along the way that all of my books start with a personal existential crisis. Yeah. And <laughs> the crisis that launched me into my journey towards finding my own inner tortoise and launching effectively the slow movement was uh, a, a very private and intimate moment, which was when I started reading bedtime stories to my son. And back in those days, I was just so fast that I, I really couldn't slow down. So I I would skip lines, paragraphs. I became an expert in what I called the multiple page turn technique, which I'm, I'm getting, yeah, we've all been there, right? Genius, but yeah, and I it, think I'm, yeah, but we're, we're good, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> but it's not a good look and it never works, right? Because our kids know the stories back to front. My son would always catch me and say, you know, daddy, why does Snow White only have three dwarves? You know, it was just, it was just <laughs> awful. And I got to this moment <laughs> where I found myself flirting with buying a book I'd heard about called The One minute bedtime story, right? So Snow White in 60 seconds. And I remember reading about this book and thinking, you know what? That's the book for me. I need that now. Amazon drone delivery, right? But then, you know, the light bulb went on over my head and it was one of those moments of genuine epiphany. I suddenly thought, whoa, what's happened to me here? I, I am racing through my life instead of living it. And that was the the powder keg moment, right? That was the catalyst for for starting my own move towards slowing down. But let me just like, like pick up the second part of your question, which is what does slow mean, right? It doesn't mean doing everything slowly. I am not an extremist of slowness. Man, I love speed faster is often better. We all know that, but not always, right? And that's kind of the core of this slow revolution or slow movement. It's about doing things at the right speed. Like musicians talk about the tempo justo, the right tempo for each piece of music. That kind of gets at what the slow with a capital S movement is about. It's about choosing when to go fast and sometimes when to slow down, right? It's a it's a mindset. It's quality over quantity. It's being present and in the moment. Ultimately, slow with a capital S is about doing everything not as fast as possible, but as well as possible. A super simple idea, but one that can just revolutionize and improve everything you do. So what were you doing? So let's go back to that period of time when you were reading. And I've got four little kids, so believe me. Uh, mm. The many a bedtime story. You know story. the multiple page turn technique. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, and, and I absolutely am guilty of having multiple times. I remember, Dad, did you did you miss something, or why didn't you read that? That's yeah. what it was. Where I started to get caught is when my kids could start to read. Yeah. They'd say, "Well, why didn't you read that part?" Right. So as I was getting older and I'm like, man, you're starting to be now you're you're catching up to my techniques. But what were you what were you doing professionally during that period of time? Yeah, I was a journalist or a foreign correspondent. So a, mm -hmm. a, a profession by its very nature built on deadlines, right, built on mm -hmm. getting things out the door as quickly and as swiftly as possible. And I gravitated first to that profession because I'm naturally a fast person. That's one reason I ended up in that line of work. But I think that line of work probably made me faster, right? It did push me into a kind of deadlineism where I turned every moment of the day, even when I didn't need to be fast, I would be speeding up. So those moments when I was sitting down to read Snow White, I was not on the clock, right? There was no deadline. I, the work was basically done. I, it was not, wasn't like I had to rush off and do anything. There was nothing important or urgent waiting for me at the end of bedtime stories, but I still did bedtime stories in turbo mode, right? Because I was stuck <laughs> in roadrunner mode. And, yeah. and I think that's what happens to a lot of us is the virus of hurry gets into our veins and it ends up infecting every moment of our lives. Even when we don't have to go fast, we go fast, right? It becomes our default mode. So, but where is that? It's almost like if we've been boiled, slowly boiled like frogs, like where does it, why, <laughs> why is that happen to us? Is it technology? We can do 17 things at one time. Is it Whose fault is it? Why? And, and, and has it has it gone 
too far. Maybe I, th I think of this as almost Moore's law, right? About computing power doubles every four years. Do it, it's like in my mind, it's like, well, humans need to keep up with technology, and we just at some point, right? Technology is almost stuck us in overdrive, or yeah. Tell, what are your I thoughts think that's, about that? That's where we are now. Is that we are bumping up against the limits of what human beings and let's be honest, the planet can take, right? This yeah. All of this constant acceleration for much of the modern era was by and large a good thing, yeah, I, I would argue, right? The speeding up was, was good for us in, in many different ways. But I think that in the last sort of 15 years, we've entered the stage of diminishing returns where we have turned everything into a race against the clock, right? This is the world of speed yoga, drive through funerals, you know? I mean, it's just even things that are designed to slow us down, we are manically trying to accelerate them. And we're paying a heavy price, you know? We're paying a price in, in health, uh, physical and mental. Uh, look at how, how, how few of us can get through the day without, I don't know how much, caffeine, uh, stress. Uh, children these days go having all kinds of, you know, burnouts, right? Children in primary school, you know, young kids struck because everything is moving at the speed of software. I'm not a Luddite. I love tech, right? It's great, mm -hmm. but it's a tool. And the trouble is that tech, in a way, the tables have flipped on us so that we are now dancing to the speed of Silicon Valley uh, rather than using all of these wonderful gadgets to make our lives better, to make them slower, which we can do if we use them more wisely. So I, I, I wanna make it really clear up front that, like I said before, I'm not against speed. And by the same token, I'm not anti-tech, right? I'm not a Luddite. I love, I've got an iPhone, right? I'm speaking to you on my top of the line, <laughs> straight out of the gate MacBook, right? And, and I, I went for the fastest MacBook out there. <laughs> speed is good, right? But it depends what you do with that speed, right? If I'm using my MacBook to check emails in the middle of the night, that's not a wise use of speed, right? But if I can speak to you on the other side of the planet with a good, solid internet connection, that's good speed, right? There's good fast, bad fast. There's good slow, and there's bad slow. And that's the thing to keep in mind here. So let, let's, how quickly were you able to kind of almost revolutionize this or create this movement for yourself? And then how, is, how has it changed your life? Well, the, the first thing to say out of the gate is that slowing down is slow. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the ironies of our fast forward culture is that we even want to slow down fast, right? So I, I really genuinely get people saying to me, oh, I, you know, I read your book or I watched your TED talk or I, and I thought, yes, I need to slow down. So I signed up for yoga and then I ran across the street to do some meditation. Then I rushed home to cook a slow food meal for my, and you know, that's not quite the right approach here. You're not, you're not getting it, right? That's not going to, that's going to end badly. I think you need to slow down slowly, right? With small steps, small adjustments, little pilot projects, experiments, try stuff out for a week. If it doesn't work, modify it, chuck it out the window, whatever. And also just be patient because I mean, one metaphor I often use for our addiction to speed is addiction, right? It's like a drug. You're coming off a drug and no one comes off a drug you know, there are withdrawal symptoms. It takes time to reset, reboot, recalibrate your body, your mind, your spirit. Yeah, you don't just snap your fingers one day and tomorrow morning you have the inner calm of the Dalai Lama. Yeah, these things mm -hmm. take time. We're, we're, we're talking about coming off a serious chemical, physical, emotional, metaphysical, philosophical addiction, the addiction to speed and hurry and distraction and overstimulation. So it takes time. That, that's, that's the key thing to hang on to here. You will get there, but you need to slow down slowly. And I did it, right? I mean, I, and if I can do it, man, I can tell you anyone can, because I, I, like I say, I'm, I'm a naturally fast person. You can tell from the way I still speak. Yeah, I, I like speed. I'm talking to you from London, my favorite city in the world. I live here. I love the volcanic energy of it. I love fast. Yeah, I'm a hockey player. But what what slowing down did for me was it allowed me to, I was going to say tolerate, but actually also fall in love with slowness, I think is the right way to put it. And so I, I now have that gear change. So there are moments when I've got to go fast. I can go as fast as anyone out there, but mm -hmm. I'm not like that all the time. There are other moments where I just take it down many, many gears and I go slow. And it for me, it's just been an utter game changer. You know, I've got more energy because I'm not tired from going fast all the time. Uh -huh. I'm happier, right? I, I take more pleasure from things. I may do fewer things, but the things I do, I do them well. Yeah. And I'm really there in, in the moment. 
Uh, I'm more productive at work. I get more done because I'm not rushing all the time. That's what I think of this del the delicious paradox of slow, that by slowing down and approaching every moment of your day with that slow filter, that slow spirit, not only do you get stuff done better, but often you get it done more quickly. <laughs> um, so you have got to slow down to speed up if you like it at work. My relationships are stronger because I'm with people, right? I'm not distracted. I'm not rushing. I'm not trying to skip pages with bedtime story. But in a lot of ways, I think I think it comes down to um, relationships. That's sort of the thing I feel I've got back the most. And those are relationships that most. work as well. Yeah. You notice it at work. You listen. You hear things that you didn't hear before because you're actually listening. Uh, all yeah. that sort of stuff pays off in the workplace just as much as it does at home. And, and also there's a kind of bigger payoff uh, I'll signal here as well, which is that one thing you gain when you slow down is sp space and time to reflect, to, to ponder the big questions like, who am I? What is my purpose here? <laughs> am I living the right life for me, right? Those big questions that just go out the window when you're stuck in roadrunner mode. Because when you're stuck in fast forward, all you have time or bandwidth for is the small stuff. Like, where are my keys? I'm late for my 11 a.m. <laughs> you don't ever stop and really think and really look inside. And in a way, I think the pandemic for many people was that, right? If it was, of course, it was a total nightmare, the pandemic. I've hated it from start to finish, but but I think it has had a silver lining for many of us because for many of us, it was like a global workshop in slow. It forced us to slow down. It took FOMO off the table. And mm -hmm. what happened? Well, for the first time in, for many people in their lives, they had time to slow down. They had time to look at the big picture, to let their minds wander, to reflect, to look inside. And I think that explains why so many people are coming out of the pandemic now making big tectonic changes in their life. They're looking back. Big career they finally changes, had time. Yeah. They're looking yeah. back and saying, you know what? The life I led before, uh-uh. That was the Too wrong much. life. I was on autopilot because I was going so fast. I've had some time to slow down, taken stock. I'm going to make some changes. So people are leaving jobs, changing careers, bad relationships, all that stuff that was just getting pushed to one side because we were skating over the top of it at full speed. We slowed down and a lot of us are now living the lives that we we ought to have been living probably years before. How do we know if we are stuck in fast forward? I mean, I, I guess I would probably be, I, I hadn't, I remember in preparing for our conversation here today, just thinking, wow, I am like the worst. At the, I'm the worst because I know that I'm stuck in fast forward, um, balancing multiple jobs. So I've got clients, I've got research, I've got a right. Then we've got, to do podcasts and radio and it's all these things and it feels like the plates are always spinning and it's always like, where are my keys? <laughs> yeah. what, it, what, you know, what, what, how do we know if you're listening to retire sooner today, how do you know somebody, how would you identify or self identify if you are kind of stuck in this fast forward mode mm -hmm. or, or Carl, is it just pretty much all of us right now? Those who haven't, changed jobs during the pandemic to something, let's say, more higher quality of life? Are most people stuck? And how do you know? I think many people are, possibly even most. Yeah. Um, how do you know? I think there's a, a long list of, what's the word, symptoms maybe, or alarm mm -hmm. bells that you can see. I'll give you three that jump to mind to start with. Yeah. The first, we touched on it a moment ago, is, is exhaustion. Yeah. It's just feeling wiped out um, either during the day or certainly by the end of the day. I think the body very often is the barometer, right? It's the canary in the coal mine that sends the message saying, you are just living way too fast. So before you get to the burnout or the, you know, whatever the serious health problem is, the body will be sending you messages. And, that, and the message that comes through loud and clear telling you that you're living too fast is that you're tired all the time. Yeah, that's one, that's one good marker. A second is if you are thinking constantly about time, right? If you are freaking about it by the minutes, you're looking at your watch, you're thinking, oh, it's 10 minutes to this, what can I do? Because when you get into a slow state, people talk about being in a flow state, yeah? When you're completely engaged in, in an activity or a task, you are fully there. And the other thing that happens in that flow moment, or I call it a slow moment, is you forget the clock, yeah? Mm. So if you find yourself- It's a wonderful time. I've rarely ever- I rarely get there, but when it is, it is such a great period of time. The flow exactly, time. and you recognize that that feeling, right? It's a it's a hard it's hard for someone to give you a checklist of things. Say here exactly, this is how you get to flow. This is how you 
We just know it. It's like when you've eaten too much candy, you haven't counted the candy, but you know you've eaten too much candy, right? You just know it. And I think we know that state of flow or state of slow when we're in it. And one way to measure it, one barometer is whether we stop looking at the clock. And then a third way, which people often don't think of, but which is equally valid here for judging too much speed in your life, is memory. Because as the famous Czech novelist once said, uh, Milan Kundera, he said, uh, there is an intimate bond between slowness and remembering. And that's so true, because when you are racing through life too fast, nothing sticks. Everything's a blur. You go through the moment and it's gone. Nothing stays with you. And I think a lot of us have that sensation, right? We get to the end of the week or the month or even the year, and we look back and think, whoa, that was 2021, right? You know, I, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night, you know? Or, you know, I watched a finished a Netflix series two days ago and I don't remember how it ended, right? You know, I think that when, when memory, like memories like that don't stay, that is a very clear indicator that you are racing through because you're not there. You're simply not there. And so you're not there to absorb it and, and, and mark it and engrave it in your memory. So those are three little ways to look for warning flags, if you like. Yeah. So if our, if our audience is experiencing, the, experiencing those, which is you're, we're just, we're always worn out exhausted at the end of the day, end of the week. We are constantly thinking about time, checking a clock, checking a clock. Mm -hmm. And then our memory starts to kind of be, it's almost as though we don't give it quite enough upload time. You're going so fast. It's not even, we're not able to upload what happened. What day is it? Wait, wait, was that Tuesday, Wednesday, or was that two weeks ago? That that's when you know you're living too fast. Those are three good markers right there. Well summed up. I know that you've talked about, and we're, we do talk a lot about investing too, because part of getting to be able to retire sooner is to be able to have your finances in order and mm. have kind of the the pillars of making sure we have at least a certain minimum amount of liquid money that will then produce income and multiple income streams and then getting rid of our debt. Those are three of the big financial checkpoints. But you talk a little bit about Gates, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and how they embrace this concept and almost use the... The, the, this this need to slow down. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I'll talk specifically about those two gentlemen you mentioned there. Uh, Bill Gates was one good example of the power of slow when he was running Microsoft. Busy guy, right? A lot of stuff in his entry. He yeah. made sure every year to take what he called two think weeks, where he would unplug, leave everything behind, and go like a hermit to a cabin in the woods somewhere and just be, you know, read, let his mind drift, let his mind play around with ideas, recharge, reset, and then return, you know? And and those two weeks were not a waste of time. They were a wise investment in time, right? They were a perfect example of slow in action. So that's Gates. Buffett, just one quick quote from him. He once said famously, um, the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. Yeah. And I think that's another way of thinking about slowing down, right? I talk about in praise of slow, a flip side of that is in praise of no, yeah? We live in a world that is an infinite smorgasbord of things to do, experience, consume, buy, yeah? And the temptation is to ha- try to have it all. Having it all means hurrying it all. So a key part of slowing down and living a life worthy of the name is prioritizing. It's saying, okay, I'm going to pause, look, think about what really lights me up. And I'm going to give all of my time and energy and love and, and money to those things. Everything else I'm just going to let go, you know, less is more. So those, those are two guys right there who, who walk the slow talk. And um, yeah. And I think I'd read that, but that's a wonderful reminder. I was probably living too fast, so I don't remember it. Uh, <laughs> what? Tell me about you and your son. And I, I think I for little kids now. And well, there's, they're not so little. Um, my oldest is 15 down to six. Now we just had a bunch of birthdays and I have four boys. So I've gone through the, the book example that you've the, the quick bedtime stories going quickly, but you had this, um, st- you, one of your sons, when you were, he was little, gave you this, the, something like a sticker award. Tell, tell us that, oh, yeah, that yeah. story about how that yeah. relates back to slow. Yeah. Well, that, that was kind of my Hollywood moment right? when I realized that I had actually conquered the virus of hurry, right? And I learned how to slow down because when, when I s- stopped 
when I got off that kind of merry-go-round of doing everything faster, a, a place I began putting on the brakes was with bedtime stories. So I started going to my son's bedroom, you know, no phone, no watch, nothing, like, just going in and reading every every word, right? No, no more multiple yeah. page turn technique. <clears throat> and I guarantee you Snow White is a whole lot more fun with seven dwarves than it is with three. And, and it's funny because I remember, I, I've got to be honest, actually, it's a terrible confession to make, but um, back in my fast days, I used to hate bedtime stories, right? That's an yeah. awful thing to say is if I used to dread them, it was like a punishment beating because they were oh. so slow. I couldn't yeah. bear it, right? I just dreaded them. And then paradoxically, when I slowed down and began taking time over them, I fell in love with them because they became oh. my, like my prize or my reward at the end of the day, that sacred moment when I could be with my children just in that bubble together, hanging out, laughing, cuddling, reading stories. And the, the thing with the sticker is this, that I realized that I'd actually cracked this when I was getting ready to do a book tour of the United States. Bags were packed, waiting for the taxi to take me to the airport here in London. And my son appeared with a card that he'd made for, for me. He stapled together two index cards from the home office. And on the front, he placed a sticker of Tintin, yeah? And, and we're big Tintin fans in this family. I grew up with Tintin. We got all the, I can see all the books on the shelf where I'm sitting right now. Um, and, and I recognize the sticker as a gift a friend of the family had brought from the Tintin store in Brussels, Belgium. And when it had arrived in our home, my son had said, wow, this sticker, it's so special. I'm never gonna use it. So he'd hidden it in his room somewhere, but there it was in the front of this card, right? I opened up the card and inside he'd just written, dear daddy, love Benjamin. And I said, wow, Benjamin, what, what an amazing card, and what an honor, right? The Tintin sticker, I know what that means to you. Is this a, a card to wish me good luck on the book tour in the US? And he said, no, no, this is a card for the best story reader in the world. And I thought, Ooh. wow, yeah, I, I made a sound just like that. <laughs> I thought, wow, Man. this slowing <sighs> down really works. But I, but I slightly spoiled the moment with my next thought. I, I wish I hadn't, I, I didn't say this out loud, but inside my head, I thought to myself, Benjamin, why didn't you hurry up and say that six months ago? I could have finished my book with this beautiful anecdote, but that, that is like the total opposite of slow. So let's please go back to my first thought, which was, wow, this, this slowing down really works. <laughs> but I wanted to shift to uh, this thought around uh, aging. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you Google, I, don't, I think if you, what is it, the, uh, if you, I lie about my, what does yeah. Google fill in, right? What, what is, yeah. We know what Google, I lie about my what? My, I lie about my age, right? It says, and you talk about ageism a little bit. Uh, you wrote a book called Boulder, making the, the, the most of, a, of our longer lives. And you talk a little bit about ageism, stereotypes around age, ageism. Uh, where did that come from? Well, again, like I said at the outset, my books always You look start like from a pretty young dude. You're like, you're, right. you look like you haven't aged. <laughs> Define young, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, for me, it was an, another personal existential crisis. I was playing in a in a hockey tournament, and um, you know, we were in the quarterfinals, struggling to beat a team we'd annihilated the year before. And then out of nowhere, I scored this total highlight reel goal, the kind of goal I will be thinking about on my deathbed, you know, uh, many years from now. Pushed us into the semifinals, fl floating on air. And then I discovered, because one of the tournament organizers came up to me and he said, you know what, Carl, I've just been looking at player profiles and it turns out you're the oldest person at the tournament, right? The oldest player out of 248 guys or something, right? And I knew I was one of the oldest, right? I'm not deluded, <laughs> but somehow being the oldest <laughs> just yeah. totally rocked me, right? I just suddenly began yeah. to think like, whoa, do I deserve to be here? Are people laughing at me? Should I be taking up a more age appropriate pastime like bingo maybe? And and it was <laughs> it was like in the blink of an eye, I went from goal scorer to granddad. And, and, and it was... It was something about the fact that my chronological age that up until then had kind of been in the background or been on just numbers on my driver's license suddenly took on this terrible power. And I felt defined and limited by how old I was. And I thought, this can't be right. I'm playing well. I'm having fun. I just scored a great goal. Why should I feel like that? And that was sort of the starting point for investigating this whole cult of youth, right, that we find ourselves marinated in uh, and, and taught from such a young age that that aging is all about decline and depression and dementia. Yeah, and Zuckerberg, old Facebook old. guy. The, I'm sorry, yeah. Meta. Meta guy says, look, young people are just smarter. Yeah, and and nobody batted an eyelid. Could you imagine if somebody had stood up on stage like that and said, white people are just smarter 
or I don't know, right. uh, Christians are just smarter or men are just, you know, <laughs> there'd have been hell to pay, right? But you can yeah. say anything you like about people being older because that's the one group that is, that it's open season on, right? So we talk about, and we, and a lot of the ageist rhetoric, a lot of the ageism comes from us, ourselves, directed at ourselves. So you forget your keys, right? And you say, oh, it's a senior moment, right? Or you say, you, you say how old you are, well, I'm the wrong side of 40, yeah? Or oh, I'm feeling my age, right? Or I'm showing my age. All of these phrases that are woven into our vernacular and they all tell the same story, which is that aging sucks, right? That growing older, is all downhill from 35 when it's not right. That's absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Tell our audience why true. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Tell our audience why that is wrong. I want to know that. Why, why is the other side of 35? Not a problem. Well, well, obviously some things do change that we are not that, you know, that happy about, uh, you know, particularly uh, physically, right. As we get yeah. older, we start to suffer physically in ways that we wouldn't have in our twenties, generally speaking. But the other side of the ledger, easily offsets that for most of us, right? For m most of our later life, right? So things like uh, the U-shaped happiness curve, that people tend to get happier in later life, right? We, we follow a curve, we start very high in childhood, bottom out in middle age, then we bounce back up so that the adults report the highest levels of happiness. Actually, you know what? I've read a lot about that because I, I, I've i read these books around happiness and I study happiness research. So I've read many uh, an article or even Almost, I think I've even read this in like a medical journal because there's been a lot of studies around. Oh, yeah, you can you just, for those who don't understand what that is, can you just give us a quick reminder of the U sure. curve of happiness? It, it's it's that human beings trace in their lifespan a, a U-shaped happiness curve. So we start high in childhood, we fall steadily till we bottom out in middle age, and then we bounce back up again. So that across all, pretty much all cultures, socioeconomic groups, you find that the, the group, the demographic group that reports the highest levels of life satisfaction and happiness are the over 50s or over 55s, which totally goes against the prevailing ageist idea, which is that older people think of the words we use, grumpy, cranky. Grumpy you know, old angry. man. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. When in fact, the opposite is scientifically demonstrably true. You know, when is so the bottom of the U, by the way? When is the... Uh, when they reckon when is it's the around... They reckon it's around 40, mid 40s, I think, is where it tends to bottom out. 45, 50 seems to be the bottom yeah, of the year. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> so I've, I've come out the other end um, and I'm feeling, pr you know, pretty chipper. Uh, but, you know, I can look forward. I'm 54 now, right? That means I can look forward to getting even happier right, as even the happier, years yeah. unfurl. And it seems like this U-shaped curve seems to be, uh, they've seen it in bonobos, chimpanzees, and orangutans, which suggests it's hardwired into our primate genes, right? It's it's Mother Nature's gift to the aging, right? Kind of fascinating, right? So it's not great if you're in your in your middle of your life cycle, but then you can look forward to getting even happier statistically exactly. and scientifically. Yeah. So how are we? Let's say how how is the world changing uh, to help us maybe age a little bit better and uh, feel well, better about aging? Sure. Well, for start, there's science. Medicine. I mean, we're you know. Th let, let me tell you, this is the best time in human history to be aging, right? <laughs> you look yeah. around at the the, the 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 treatments and drugs and stuff we have. We, you know, we're getting to the point now where we can, uh, you know, put if someone loses the power to w operate a limb, we can use the brain to you know, just extraordinary things, right? Uh, Andy Murray, uh, the Scottish tennis player, uh, got his hip replaced or resurfaced. He's back playing, you know, top level singles men tennis, right? On the tour. Unbelievable. This is science fiction, right? On that yeah, level. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so that's one side of it. Uh, the other thing I think that is, is plays in favor of um, aging is that the economy has shifted, right? We no longer base most jobs on brute strength, right? That, that those days are gone, right? What, what gets you ahead in the, in the modern workplace is brains. Yeah. It's brain power. It's not brawn anymore. And we right. know, and again, that's one of the upsides of aging is that a lot of things get better as we get older brain wise, right? We get, we have experience. We're able to join the dots. We can weigh up multiple viewpoints better. Our social acumen and social skills improve, uh, create some forms of creativity get better because they depend on two things that only aging can confer time and experience. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why we, especially now, as the, the population ages and we've got this huge lack of workers in the economy, we've got this massive untapped reservoir of older workers who can step right in and do these jobs in a way that wouldn't have been 
available to us 30 years ago. So that's that's one big change as well. You know, I wanted to ask you about creativity. I mean, the, is it is it true that uh, Julia Child didn't learn? Julia Childs didn't, or it's Julia Child, I think, didn't Single. learn to cook. Julia Child, yeah. yeah, yeah. Julia Child, did she really not learn to cook until she was something like in her forties? Is that true? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so she was about yeah, forty. Okay. So I don't know how good you are in the kitchen, <laughs> but if you if you aren't, there's still hope, right? You know, um, and and you know, people go on learning stuff all the way through. I mean. One example of my my mom, who's um, 80 now, gives private French lessons in her spare time. And her star pupil is 60 year old, 60 something healthcare worker, right? Who's soaking up French grammar and vocabulary like a sponge. Yeah. I mean, the human being, human, you know, that idea of, um, you know, the, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's not even true of dogs. Yeah. We can go on learning all the way through our lives and we can go on creating as well. Maya Angelou. Uh, the writer had a wonderful quote. She said, um, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. And that's why if you look across the arts and the sciences, you find people doing triumphantly creative work in later life, whether it's, you know, that's Beethoven, true. Bach, Matisse, right? Th these people have all done extraordinary things in the winter and the autumn of their lives. Uh, you don't fall off a creativity cliff at some stage in your 20s or whatever or th anywhere. You don't fall off a learning cliff. You're, 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 you're on an upward curve, right? Like the happiness curve. You can carry on enriching yourself all the way through your life if you have the right approach, yeah? if, you, if you approach life with that spirit. You know, one of the pillars of, of a really happy retirement are something called core pursuits or hobbies and steroids. And some, uh, and very often, one of those or maybe more, of, more than one of those can be part-time work yes. or ho something around part-time work, staying yep. involved, particularly with our audience that are happy retire that are earlier retirees. I just had a, I, I was just sat with a, a teacher this week who started teaching right out of school and now already has her 30 years in, but she's only in her fifties. I mean, she is young, like super yeah. young, but now she's got this pension that is going to maybe not be quite enough that she needs. She's got some savings, but we were talking about doing something totally new, totally different. And her question was like, I think a lot of folks who get older, well, I've done this one thing forever. How, what am I going to offer to the world? Where am I going to go work besides continuing to do teach or tutoring? Mm -hmm. But, but you talk a little bit about how our productivity can rise because we're, let's say, a, maybe more creative, B, maybe socially we're, we're better at mm -hmm. connecting. Help our audience find some, let's say, hope and creativity on a next phase as they get older when it comes to, to any, any kind of part-time work. Yeah. Well, I think a, a, an important piece of advice here is to slow down, right? Because if you're going to make that transition, if you're going to open up a new chapter, you don't want to be diving in. I mean, you can. I mean, it's not going to be the end of the world. But you're better placed, I think, if you just stop and take some time. Take take a six-month, one-year sabbatical and just, I don't know, travel, read, expose yourself to novelty, do new things, right? Open yourself up. And I think if you take that slow time, you will find, you'll hear a voice, right? You'll find a, a new path will open up. If you're at that kind of stuck stage at, I don't know, early 50s or whatever, 60 or wherever you are, right? And you're thinking... I've run out of road with this chapter, right? It's coming to a close, but I can sense that there are more chapters in my book. I just don't know what the next chapter looks like. It's, it's don't expect to download your next chapter from Amazon, right? You know, it's going to take time. <laughs> it's going to take slowness. We're coming full circle here, right? To, to, to let your mind wander, uh, to talk to people, to go experience things. And I think with the experience you've got by that stage, uh, you will be able, with that slow moment, however long it takes, to identify what the next step will be. So I, I would I would recommend people not get panicked because I know I work with a lot of people in this situation who finish a job or finish a, a, a chapter in their life. They get up the next day and they're freaking out. They're thinking, oh, 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 what yeah. do I, you know. Where, I what, Where am I going next? You know, what am I gonna do next? You know, I'm, I'm, time is running out. I need to, and then they'll, you know, either you know end up in a kind of panic state or they will jump into something that ends up being a, a, a wasted rabbit hole where they do something for six months or two, or, or they go back down to the same thing they were doing before because that feels like a comfort blanket. No, I think you got to sit with that discomfort, that uncertainty, that doubt in that liminal space, if you like, between chapters and just open yourself up 
uh, to your own experience and to what you can expose yourself to in that in-between time. And you will find things. Kind of goes back to your two weeks in a cabin. There you go. Bill Gates. Yeah, and he's, he's managed to make some pretty successful transitions in his life, hasn't he? Uh, yeah, it's having those, and it may be two weeks in a cabin. It may be two years, right? It may be two months, but it's going to take time. And I think this is, I think, a big, this is such a common thing, right, is that people get off the merry-go-round, get off the, 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 speed, the speed wheel, and then they instantly feel they've got to be on the next merry-go-round. No, this is the time to stop, to pause, <laughs> to reflect, to take stock, and then you'll find your next you'll know, your next step. I guarantee. Well, it. part of this, I love your metaphor where you're talking about how yes, maybe our eyes get a little not so, not as strong as we get older. We need glasses to see small print, but the bigger picture we're maybe better at as we get older. Yeah. Maybe this is part of the upswing of that happiness U curve, where maybe getting the bigger picture is part of why our happiness increases as we get into into our fifties plus. I think it absolutely is. I think we get a sense of how things are joined together. Uh, how, I mean, this is, I mean, the st studies are really clear on this, is that as you get into that second half of life, you have a much better feel for why the world works the way it does, why things slot together like that. And, and that's, that's a huge relief, right? Because that's one of the things, if you think back to what life and the world looked like in your 20s, it was, it was kind of scary in lots of ways. You couldn't work out, you know, I wasn't sure why things were happening and stuff. I think you have a much clearer sense of the why. And once you've got a grip on the why, very often everything else falls into place. Or for, at the very least, you feel less anxious because you've got a sense of of the pur of a purpose, right? That you can see why things are happening and it allows you to work, find your own why, if you like. So one last thing as we, as we wrap here, Carl, is that uh, if, if you're thinking, you're listening to this interview, this episode, and you're thinking, okay, I'd love to slow it down. Uh, what would be a first step? for someone to start doing that. I know you said slow down slowly is one, mm -hmm. but just is there a kind of a catalyst or first step for you to be able to to start yeah. thinking this through? I'll give you th th three quick tips for slow okay. to start off, right? The first is just do less, right? So look at your calendar for the next week and each day identify one thing, the least important thing and drop it. Boom. Just drop it. it, throw it out. Because I'm almost certain it's not that important, right? You won't even remember it six months from now. That's one thing. Number two, use the off button on your phone. Yeah. Set aside two hours, whenever they are, every day next week or one hour. Let's start with one hour and just switch off your phone. Be away from screens for our, ideally in a, in a place of nature, like a, a wood or a park or something. But even just in your home, just off screen for an hour, one day a week, one day, one day, every day of, of, of the next week. And then the third suggestion is to incorporate some kind of slow ritual into your life, something that will inoculate you or vaccinate you against the virus of hurry. So that can be, I don't know, yoga or reading poetry or meditation or drawing, sketching, whatever it is, just build, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of that into each of your days uh, for the next week. So one mm. of those, you don't even, you know, I don't want to freak people out and say, do three things, pick one of those next week and give it a roll and, and, and go with it. And the thing about slow is once you taste it, it's, it's, this taste is so sweet. You never go back. Right. Well, awesome. So Carl, thank you so much. Uh, and, and again, uh, this is the kind of thing that when, when I found you via Ted talk, I thought, wow, it's such a, I'm so guilty of living fast. I think our audience, these achievers that are listening, they're guilty of living so fast. And it's, listen, it's just part of the world. We've kind of wanted to keep up and the world gets faster with tech and we've almost hit our ceiling of human fastness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great thing to share, uh, you know, kind of your life's work. What a great thing to share to our audience that are a bunch of achievers and, and they, they have the opportunity um, probably more than almost anyone to be able to, to take some time in the woods, mm -hmm. take some, you know, uh, the, t take a little bit of time to understand how to slow it down a little bit. And I, I just love the concept. And I thank you for bringing that to our audience here today. Thank you, Wes. It's been a pleasure chatting with you from uh, start to finish.